tonight, one year after the meltdown, the president warns Wall Street risk takers don't expect another bailout. History cannot be allowed to repeat itself. And we'll talk exclusively with the Secretary of the Treasury. Is an across the board tax increase inevitable? I'm Katie Couric, also tonight, murder at Yale. Police ID the body of a grad student and are now focusing on a possible suspect. But what was the motive? This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. And this is a special Western edition. Good evening, everyone. President Obama came here to New York today to deliver a personal warning to Wall Street. Do not go back to the kind of risk taking that led to the collapse of Lehman Brothers one year ago today, which triggered the national economic meltdown. Because if you do, the president said, don't expect another taxpayer bailout. Our chief White House correspondent Chip Reed begins our special coverage of the market meltdown one year later. Thank you. The president came to New York armed with a stern lecture for the Wall Street bankers who helped cause the financial meltdown one year ago, amid signs that some are already returning to their old ways. We will not go back to the days of reckless behavior and unchecked excess that was at the heart of this crisis, where too many were motivated only by the appetite for quick kills and bloated bonuses. The president said Wall Street should police itself, but just in case, he also called for a long list of major reforms, including streamlining the huge bureaucracy of agencies that oversee Wall Street, a new agency to protect consumers from banks and credit card companies, tough new regulation of exotic financial instruments that caused much of the turmoil, and new power to oversee huge firms like AIG and even dismantle them if they threaten to destabilize the economy. One year ago... If you think it all sounds familiar, you're right. The president gave a nearly identical speech three months ago. Proposing a sweeping overhaul of the financial regulatory system. But with Congress and the country swept up in health care reform, the White House worries financial reform could be forgotten. Reform advocates say the president's active involvement is the best weapon they have in the fight against Wall Street. The high-priced lobbyists, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the big Wall Street banks, they're swarming all over Capitol Hill. One reform Congress has passed is legislation giving the federal government veto power over executive pay at some top Wall Street firms, but critics say it's had little effect. Compensation at the top five Wall Street banks is now nearly as high as it was two years ago when the sky was the limit. Today, the president said it's time to give shareholders a say in what executives are paid. Chip Reed, CBS News, New York. And on the subject of bonuses, Bank of America is in trouble over the three and a half billion dollars it paid Merrill Lynch executives when it took over their firm last year. The SEC accused BOA of hiding the total from its shareholders, but agreed to drop civil charges if the bank paid thirty three million dollars. But today, a federal judge rejected that proposed settlement, saying it cannot remotely be called fair and ordering the case to go to trial. The worst of the meltdown that started a year ago may be over and the market stabilized, but banks are still failing one after another. Here's business correspondent Anthony Mason with more on that. Federal regulators seized this Chicago bank Friday, this Seattle lender, and this Minnesota bank. Already this year, 92 banks have failed. In 2007, there were just three failures. One year after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the banking system and the credit markets are still feeling the economic aftershocks. The markets are still, uh, they're, they're not... They're not shut down, but they're still dysfunctional. 20, 40, and 50. Georgia's first Cherokee State Bank is healthy, but CEO Carl Hames admits. It's extremely tough out there, and most community banks in Georgia have struggled in terms of uh, raising additional capital. 416 banks are currently on the FDIC's problem list of vulnerable financial institutions. Smaller banks in particular are under growing pressure from bad commercial loans they made for offices, malls or hotels. Aside from the uh, foreclosure problem in the housing market, the most significant threat to the economy is the growing number of commercial mortgage loan defaults, which is going to be very difficult for a lot of small banks to digest. 
For example, 16% of construction loans are now in delinquency, more than triple the number in 2007. And 38% of all loans for condominium construction are 30 days or more past due. Chorus Bank, seized by the FDIC on Friday, was one of the country's biggest condo construction lenders. Its delinquencies were running more than 70%. Banks also hadn't counted on near 10% unemployment, which has consumers cutting their spending, putting many retailers in trouble. To the extent that the consumer doesn't, uh, doesn't come back, then commercial real estate itself won't come back. That could mean malls or hotels may not be able to meet their mortgage payments, which will mean more losses for the banks. A year ago, the American financial system went into the emergency room. The patient may be out of intensive care, but it still needs help getting on its feet. Katie. Anthony Mason. Thank you, Anthony. Also with the president on Wall Street today was the Secretary of the Treasury, Timothy Geithner. His department put out a report detailing the next phase of stabilizing and regulating the financial system. And in an exclusive interview, Geithner told me that the economy is in much better shape today than it was when the meltdown began last September. A year ago, people for the first time in a century in this country were wondering about whether they should keep their money in banks. But today, you have a lot of private capital came into the financial system. The system is stronger because of that. Borrowing costs have coming down for corporations and for families. Those are the initial signs of improvement. And that's why, why the economy is starting to grow again. Having said that, it's been a year since Lehman collapsed. And yet, Congress has passed only one major piece of financial regulation having to do with credit cards. Derivatives, still largely unregulated. Huge bonuses are back. So what has really changed? Well, uh, Kitty, we're going to change this financial system fundamentally. We have to, because we can't afford to let this country be in a position again where you could suffer this much damage. And that's going to require a comprehensive reform, but it requires legislation. This kind of headline must give you indigestion. It says, progress is slow on regulatory overhaul, posing risk of even bigger crisis. Again, actually, I think Congress is going to move this year. I think they're going to move earlier than any country in response to past crises has thought about reform. Let me ask you about bonuses, because some firms cutting back on them are actually raising salaries. As you know, five of the biggest banks set aside $60 billion to cover compensation. That's just $17 billion less than 2007 and with layoffs that's a lot fewer people getting that money so doesn't this amount to business as usual in many ways uh, it, we can't let business as usual we can't let things go back to where they were but isn't this a shell game they're just putting more money for salaries and less for bonuses well, and people if, are still getting mega if, if that's what happens payments? if that's what happens that we would have failed someone is going to have to pay down the mountain of debt created by this financial crisis do you believe mr secretary uh, an across the board tax increase is inevitable i think people recognize that these deficits are unsustainable and if we're going to have a stronger economy in the future we have to bring them down is an across the board tax increase inevitable i don't i don't think so no as you know economic growth is powered by consumer spending and a recent gallup poll found that 70% of Americans are cutting expenses. So what out there, Secretary Geithner, might light a fire under the economy and create sustainable growth? It's going to come gradually, but the first step is to pull the economy back from the abyss. And do you really feel that you have done everything in your power to put systems in place as quickly as possible to prevent a financial crisis of this magnitude from ever happening again? Uh, not, absolutely not. Not yet. But as I said, that requires Congress legislating reforms. I asked Secretary Geithner if he'll extend the controversial TARP program when it expires at the end of the year. He told me he hasn't decided yet. In other news, the case of a Yale graduate student got national attention when she disappeared last week, just days before she was to be married. Today, a body found hidden inside a lab building was identified as that of Annie Lay. Randall Pinkston has the latest on the investigation into who might have killed her and why. Flowers lined the corner near the Yale University building where the body of 24-year-old Annie Lay was found on what was to be her wedding day. And she loved people. She loved life. And uh, there's 
We just can't imagine anybody wanting to harm Annie. It was 5 p.m. yesterday when sniffer dogs led police to a small space where Lay's body was discovered behind a basement wall known as a chase, an area for accessing pipes and wires. Law enforcement sources tell CBS News investigators are focusing on one probable suspect employed as a lab technician and that it was not a random act. One source also says the suspect was someone Lay may have known. Detectives and investigators right now have a, a large amount of physical evidence at the scene that we're going through to determine if it's linked to this case or not. She was last seen Tuesday morning. She left her purse and cell phone in her campus office, then walked four blocks to the lab at the School of Nursing. Just after 10 a.m., she was seen entering the building on a security camera, one of 75 that provided taped evidence for police review. Access to the building is limited. An ID card is required to enter the lobby the corridors, and each card is coded for specific work areas. At noon, an unexpected fire alarm went off. Police are investigating whether it may have been triggered by her killer. When she didn't come home by 9 p.m., her roommate called police. Yale has its own force, but the investigation didn't move into high gear for hours. The entire campus didn't get an email alerting them to the situation until Thursday. As hours turned to days, initial speculation that Lay was a runaway bride shifted to alarm. By Thursday, the FBI and state police entered the investigation, scouring the entire building. But the presence of lab animals in the building may have initially confused search dogs. A law enforcement source says the suspect failed at least one polygraph. The medical examiner has not released the cause of death. Tonight, Yale University holds a vigil in Annie Lay's memory, a hardworking scholar and bride-to-be. Randall Pinkston, CBS News, New Haven, Connecticut. In California today, a judge set bail for Philip Garrido at $30 million. He and his wife, Nancy, have pleaded not guilty to charges of kidnapping then 11-year-old J.C. Duggard in 1991 and keeping her as a sex slave in their backyard. Nancy Garrido is being held without bail. Also today, a psychiatric evaluation was ordered for Philip Garrido. Here in New York City, police and federal agents raided four homes early today as part of a terrorism investigation. Justice correspondent Bob Orr is covering the story. Bob, what's this about? Well, Katie, the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force moved with uncommon speed early today in searching a number of New York City homes for evidence of a potential domestic terror plot. Sources say intelligence officials were concerned about a small group of Queens residents who had espoused militant ideas and sympathized with al-Qaeda. Specifically, one of the men, an American citizen from the Midwest, recently had traveled to Afghanistan and Pakistan. And sources say he had contacts with suspected terror operatives. Now, we have to say nobody was arrested in the pre-dawn raids. And so far, agents say they found no explosives. More importantly, sources say there was no plot against any American target uncovered. Sources say the travel and the frequent phone contacts with known bad guys overseas and a general lack of information about the group's potential plans all of that forced the FBI to move very quickly. On top of that, a number of high-profile events, the 9-11 anniversary, the president's visit to New York and the U.S. Open were all reason for some concern. But to underscore, officials say there was no plot and no immediate danger. Katie? All right, Bob, we're in Washington. Thanks very much for that. The terrorist behind 9-11 is making new threats in an audio I'm tape posted on the Internet today. A voice I'm believed I'm to be that of Osama bin Laden threatens to step up insurgent attacks in Afghanistan and also claims President Obama is powerless to stop them. In Germany today, an emergency landing turned into a terrifying spectacle. A German jetliner en route from Berlin on a domestic flight was descending toward a runway in Stuttgart with malfunctioning landing gear. As it hit the ground, flames engulfed the bottom of the Fokker 100, but the fire was quickly extinguished and none of the 78 people on board was seriously hurt. Coming up next, is something funny going on in this picture? The photo op that became a big problem for a world leader. And finally tonight, French President Nicolas Sarkozy is often compared to Napoleon. Like the emperor, Sarkozy is fiery, has a beautiful wife, and wants to rebuild his country's image. Oh, and one more thing they have in common, and it's a bit of a touchy subject. 
Here's Mark Phillips on Le Petit Président. It was a short photo opportunity that's turned into a long story. Something about French President Nicolas Sarkozy's visit to an auto parts plant in northern France didn't measure up. Look at the workers in the white coats chosen to stand around Sarkozy. None is taller than the French president, who's listed in the program as five foot five and is known to be a little vertically sensitive. Sarkozy surrounded by shorter people does not happen often, and this wasn't an accident. The president's aides are accused of bussing in workers who satisfied one small criteria. Were you chosen for your size, this woman was asked. Yes, she says. Because you weren't taller than the president? That's right. Sarkozy's office says the idea they shrunk the audience is stretching the truth. But the French public has become used to their president's attempts to gain stature. Sarkozy's ex-model wife, the five foot nine Carla Bruni, often wears flats in his presence while he wears the heels in the family. And sharing a stage with other world leaders can produce its own vertical challenges. At the D-Day commemoration this year, Sarkozy rose to that challenge by standing on a box. He's really obsessed about, about uh, his, his look. And also during the last summer, he, he spent a lot of time on, on dieting because he, he was a bit fat. And when you are fat and short, it's a problem. There is precedent in France for the little man accomplishing big things. When Napoleon did it, they named a complex after him. Mark Phillips, CBS News, London. I feel his pain. And that is the CBS Evening News for tonight. I'm Katie Couric. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night.